Um, but it, when you, it didn't matter where I went, if whether it was in my own neighborhood or different places all around the country, I noticed that there really were only two different kinds of real estate development in poor communities. And there's one that promotes gentrification and displacement and does it in a very deliberate way. And there's one that as just assumes it, you're going to maintain a certain poverty level. You know, if you build huge amounts of, of subsidized, you know, very low income housing, that's all that's going to move in there, period. So, and you create goods and services around maintaining that model. And I thought, geez, for the love of God, I mean, I think we could be a little more creative than that. And um, so I started thinking more and more about, well, what is that? Even before I like, look at that thing. Um, you know, I realized that what we actually needed were opportunities for, for aspirational communities. You know, because prior to integration, you know, when segregation was actually quite legal, you know, in most of this country, um, if you happen to be black, chances are you lived in a black community with a lot of different types of people. Um, there were folks that, so it wasn't uncommon, you know, for a doctor to live near a janitor who lived near a teacher. You know, these were just, that's what happened. Um, it wasn't quite as segregated. But then, um, so there was a lot more economic diversity, rather. But as soon as it was legal for black folks to move in places that, you know, that they could move to, they did, just like anybody else would. You know, it's like you could move to a better neighborhood, why wouldn't you? And, um, and I even experienced that to some extent like during the fires, um, because we actually did have a bit of, of, of some economic diversity um, in our communities. But when the fires started happening, people that were more middle class were gone. They moved to New Rochelle. They moved to Co-op City. They moved out just far away from the South Bronx as they possibly, possibly could. And I saw that with my own eyes as a kid. Um, and the rest of us, you know, my father bought our house when in the 1940s. It was not worth anything in the 1970s. Where will we, will we sell it to whom? Who was going to buy it? And then what were we going to do with that little ten, fifteen thousand um, dollars $15,000? Buy what? So we stayed. And, uh, and so watching this, and you know, those were, those were the unintended consequences of integration. No one's going to say that we shouldn't ha let this happen. You know, that people have a right to live where they want to do. But I also think we had a great opportunity to create the kind of aspirational and true diverse, economic diversity in communities that allow different folks to see each other and be in a way that allows them to, to see possibility you know, in developing communities that aren't just all poor or all super wealthy. And um, so because what, we, what we've left behind in, those, in the poorer communities is basically pockets of, of hopelessness. And there are things that I think we can do that can change things as well. But, but to look at this slide, I mean, once I noticed a bunch of different things. Again, I'm going to show you some pictures of, of, the, of the South Bronx, but the bottom line is, you know, this, this, what I'm showing you right now, it could be any town USA. You know, been there, done that, seen it. So, but what you find, you know, that gray line, that's the Bruckner Expressway down the middle. On one side, you, the red lines indicate commercial activity, you know, like little commercial strips. Um, on the other side of the Bruckner, um, you've got one little commercial strip, but the, um, all those yellow dots indicate density. So you've got some major possibilities you know, to increase density on both sides and increase economic development on both sides. Um, so when you look at that, you know, but you've also got some other cool things going on. You know, from the fact that, that that green line, that's the green way coming through it. There's always assets in somebody's community. You just have to know what you're looking for. And so, but, but clearly, that was an asset there. And also, the other asset here you know, is the connection to mass transit right on the other side. Um, but again, the, the, the Bruckner is a barrier. I mean, obviously, people move over it each and every day. But there are definitely ways to make that a little bit better to do. But again, this kind of hinge area, the yellow area refers to the, um, uh, the, in the residential area. The blue is the industrial area. And then right in that middle section is this little hinge area. You know, that used to be the, the fluid place where you know, people moved back and forth between to get from either the industrial to the residential place. But you know, now, you've, your, indus your industrial place, you know, it's, it's not all that great in a lot of ways. There's actually a lot of disuse there. There's actually, this, in particular, on the, on the blue side directly next to the residential place, there's not a whole lot going on. I mean, um, some truck parking lots, uh, some uh, illegal chop shops, things like that. You know, but again, might be a great opportunity to do some really interesting stuff there. Um,
But again, looking at that, but like the, that part in the hinge area as a catalyst for what could happen there. You know, everything from housing, mixed income housing in particular, the types that will allow people, um, you know, to think about as long as it's really good quality housing, what are, you know, what would, what would make people want to live in a place like that? You know, what, what else would they need? People, higher incomes and, and of course, you know, some affordable housing as well. For the manufacturing and, and education piece, because we really want opportunities for people to become less poor. That is a really valid thing that I think we should always be working to do. Um, excellent public space is something that it is the great democratizer, you know, for civilized society. You know, it, it should be free, um, it should be wonderful, it's the kind of place that you can go and, and, and explore um, both passively and otherwise as well. And commercial and retail. We did this really interesting, very informal survey, um, and we're still in the process of doing it, um, just asking folks in our neighborhood, how much of their money do they spend in our neighborhood? Um, and it was almost none. You know, I personally import my food. Um, because there's just, I'm not going to eat the stuff that I can buy in my neighborhood. It's just not very good. Um, so the developing new opportunities for things like that most people consider normal, you know, restaurant, decent food sources, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. Having those in so that people could actually, and nice stuff so that people could actually go and spend money there is a really valuable thing. But again, this is one of the, like, one of the many underused spaces or disused spaces, you know, within our neighborhood. But imagine the idea of having something like a wholesale to the, to the, um, to the public community market in a place like that. Or even thinking about it you know, as a place for a fabrication laboratory, you know, which is when you mix personal computers with, um, it's, it's Fab Lab is short for, for fabrication laboratory. When you mix personal computers with uh, fabrication machines like milling machines and laser jet cutters and things of that nature um, and really create anything you want once you know how to, how to design um, the programming. Like for example, this was a mobile Fab Lab unit that was literally housed in an old NASCAR trailer that you know, we brought up to the South Bronx and it was a, a project that came out of MIT's Media Lab. Um, everything in this room was actually made in a, in a Fab Lab in another place, but we wanted to bring it to our community specifically so that we can help people think about becoming creators and inventors in their own mind. You know, and again, in a place where we're often told that like nothing good comes from here, you know, we, that we challenge that notion. Um, one of the fun things that we did, because even though we're a place where there is a lot of waste handling going on, you know, folks even found some really interesting things to do with some of the trash. Like, for example, those pallet boxes that get thrown out constantly. Um, some of the guys in the neighborhood discovered that those pallet boxes were, some of them were made of really nice hardwood. And that if you, you know, pulled them apart, lashed them together, you could actually make some pretty cool chairs, which were then purchased by a friend of mine, Steve Ritz, over there. <laughs> so, but this was like a really nice little, incredibly legal side hustle, you know, that some kids, <laughs> this is what we want people to be doing, okay? But you got to create the, the, the opportunities for them to do it. So having something like this, you know, in, 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 a, in a space like that would also be a great thing. Um, again, a, one of the loneliest areas, you know, in, in our neighborhood. This is a Tiffany Street. Um, but again, not unlike many that I've seen around the country. You know, it's really close to a residential section, really close to, you know, a formerly really thriving manufacturing place that's not so much anymore. But right now, this is such a lonely strip. This is what it's known as in the neighborhood. It's a great place for truckers to go and pick up a prostitute. Okay? However, when you start adding in things, you know, like the Greenway is actually going to be coming down this area, you know, that kind of activity, it just becomes just not the thing to do there, you know, when you've got this kind of stuff happening. So that's the whole point. How do you bring vibrancy to this community? We've been talking with lots of different people in the neighborhood, you know, just about what are the kind of things that they, what are the real needs out there? And so just seeing some of those things happen is exactly what we're trying to do right now, um, you know, as well. But the whole point of all this is just when you build a project like this, mixed income housing with mixed use commercial development, it is absolutely not just to say that this little you know, isolated piece is going to be this beautiful place and that's the way it should be and the rest of the neighborhood is going to stay funky. No, the whole point is that it raises the bar for the type of economic development that can and should happen all across the board that really encourages the kind of you know, of, of aspirational thinking about what a community can be that shows folks that, you know, that both, both on both sides of the aisle, 
um, in terms of those that are you know, upper income or lower income, really understanding that there are, there's a way to create local stability in our community you know, through economic diversity, you know, whether it's through developing the, kind, the new kinds of businesses in, in, that, that can come, really moving manufacturing to the, into the 21st century using clean tech and other kinds of tech, um, you know, really thinking about what are, you know, where are opportunities for entry for new um, entrepreneurs to come in, and really developing the kind of great housing stock that's going to make anybody want to live in a place like that. And so when we think about you know, the, where you know, most of our communities are right now, and then think about what they potentially could be as you think about activating the ground plane, when you're expecting that, there's, you're, that you're attracting in the kind of new economic development that, that's allowing people to see beyond their present condition, and to, and to know that you know, from a policy perspective, that you actually can set up, an, up, up the kind of um, of, of uh, opportunities that allow people to move themselves out of the, the whole idea that they will constantly be only dependent and instead actually be producers. And this is what's so exciting to me because when I think you know, about this kind of future, you know, whether in my neighborhood or all over the, 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 the Bronx or all over the country, you know, I think about actually so much about this quote. This is one of my favorite quotes in the world. And um, it's from Dr. King's uh, uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. You know, and if you uh, don't know the story, he actually wrote this letter um, to a group of white ministers who, um, you know, he was like, stuck in jail, basically, obviously. And, um, you know, and they wrote a letter, uh, you know, a public letter saying, you know, please, you know, stop this integration stuff. And I think on some level they were probably just very afraid for this man's life. I mean, he was putting himself in danger all the time. But at the same time, it was just like, what else was he going to do? for the love of God. But, um, but this, this quote spoke to me so much because we do need to be really impatient about what, our, what do we want in our lives and what kind of communities do we want to build? You know, what kind of cities do we want to live in? What kind of country do we want to live in? You know, is this the, the kind of thing that we want to continue you know, to pay uh, tribute to all of our collective failures? Or do we want to start building monuments to hope and possibility? Thank you. So are there any questions? Hi. There you go. So, so what I've seen in, in Brooklyn happen um, when we end up in these kinds of spaces is that the policy is that what is considered rent stabilized, what is considered mixed income housing could mean that po a, a, my, aunt, my mother wanted to move into a building and they said that low income housing started at $100,000. And so wow. how does one, in my mind's eye, I'm glad that there's soy milk in my mother's supermarket finally, <laughs> right? Like I want there to be mixed greens in Flatbush, Brooklyn. And I, I like you. that there's a farmer's market and all these things are great. How do I still pay rent that's affordable, even for someone who makes good money? Mm -hmm. and, and how do we then push policies that, that understand what poverty actually is and yep. what poor and working class means mm -hmm. in a real sense and not in kind of a blown up sense? Oh, I hear you <laughs> loud and clear. And, um, and I'm going to be totally real with you in, in every way that I can. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that we're going to completely just make gentrification not happen. I mean, there is going to be some kind of displacement. But what I think we can do is be incredibly intentional you know, about also creating better opportunities for people to move up and out of poverty, but also create real programs that are supportive you know, and, and create a real, truly, permanently affordable space based on what a real need is. Um, but I think we have to do that in a way that's, that's, it, that is by design intended to be supportive of people moving up and out of poverty. Like the bottom line is, like for me, when I think of permanent affordable housing, it's the units that are permanently affordable. But, there, but for me, there's an expectation that the people who live in there change. That they don't just always stay there. And I think that's the kind of thing that I really want to start bringing into this. It allows people to see that there is movement. And, and that they, but there's also going to be, I think, some more some structure in terms of how do you support 
the people who really do need supporting. From a policy perspective, I hear you loud and clear because that's not something that I'm trying to do. Because no, I don't want this to be the kind of place you know where the where the the the, the seniors that are now you know my my mom and dad's age. Well, not my my dad would have been a hundred and five this year, so it's probably not my dad's age, but my mother's age. She was 21 years younger than he was. But um, you know, but those are people that are still you know they're in fixed income.